Well, uh, my name is Medina Labakin and I do interviews with amazing people. And today <laughs> we have Jacob Cooper, who is doing some fantastic work in raising uh, awareness of life after death. Uh, and he is a author, a therapist, a teacher and a healer. And he's written a book called Life After Breath which is now available on Amazon. He also has a Facebook mentoring group he started. And it's really great to talk to him today about the fascinating subject of the fact that we are eternal beings and that we never die in truth, but we continue. We are uh, unlimited, infinite energy, potential. Um, and so I think in the midst of everything that we're going through in the world at the moment, it gives us great solace and comfort to know that we are eternal beings. It's not just this life that exists. There's so much more. And it gives you courage, I think, and strength yeah, during challenging times. So welcome, Jacob. I'm really excited to talk to you today and to discuss your wonderful book, which is just about to be released, isn't it? Life After Breath. Yeah. It's all available as of last week. Um, last week, yeah. perfect. Yeah, yeah, last week was my opening. So it's a pleasure to connect with you. Um, maybe you should tell the audience, because I was um, looking through YouTube and I'm trying to find, you know, like-minded kindred souls to, to work with. And I saw you interviewing one of my respected colleagues and I believe Jeffrey Olson, is that correct? Oh, he's uh, amazing. I love yeah, him. You know, I, I met Jeffrey. Baby. Yes. Yeah, about, about a year or two ago about you know, at a conference, but I've been following him for years and uh, his story is just incredibly moving and inspiring and he's just a wonderful okay. teacher and author. So um, you know, my book is out on Amazon as of last week. Oh, that's so exciting. And by the way, that interview after you've watched this one with Jacob, that one is a great follow-up. So it's in my video. Yeah. People want to watch it. But um, oh, that is wonderful that you're releasing this book. How long did it take you to write, Jacob? You know, that, that's a question I'm, I'm normally asked. And for people who are interested in writing books, um, you know, I'm going to be doing a writer's workshop within the next couple of months, so stay tuned. The opening quote that I have within, within my book is a quote by Dr. Wayne Dyer, who's one of my greatest teachers, and I explain how I'm connected to him in a little bit of a different way in the end. But the quote is to don't die with the music still in you, you know, yeah. meaning as long as you're playing your song and telling your story and those are telling around you telling your story, uh, you can never truly die. And that was a big inspiration behind writing my book. And so the actual book was the easy part that took me. I probably started. I got accepted by my publisher in, in January. And January this, you know, 2020, and I finished during the coronavirus and everything that was going on probably in May or June. Uh, now I worked on what's called a literary proposal, uh, which you send off to publishing companies. And that actually was a more tedious process and took me a bit longer. But the actual manuscript just you know, took me a couple of months. And I do believe, um, you know, that, that, that writing is easy, but it also requires discipline, organization, consistency. And I think really with, with the book, you want to make sure you have a book and not books in there. And yeah. so right now, what I recognized when I was done with my manuscript that I had two or three books in there. Yeah. And so I divided and organized it. And I'm pretty much almost done with my second book which uh, I'll be announcing the title of soon. I'm working with my literary um, editor and, and publisher on kind of pinpointing the right title. Uh, so it took me a couple months, but when there's a will, there's a way, I firmly believe. <laughs> Brilliant. So let, let's hear about the wonderful subject of life after breath and yeah. the journey that, 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 that involved to write that book and yeah. the, the essence of, of what the book's conveying as well. Yeah, I was on a bit of a project warp speed with finishing up this book in a sense that I saw the current condition of my clients and my own practice and the macro uh, condition and pos positionality, you know, of the world. And I wanted to get this out as soon as possible because I saw people are feeling very isolated 
did, my work as a psychotherapist, while impactful, was not enough. And I feel, felt very driven to give everything all that I had, which I think really was something that I learned. And I think a lot of people learned throughout this process was the sped up reality of the infinite, of the finite body and how that's not a guarantee, you know, tomorrow. And I learned that obviously, and I elaborate a little bit about that in my own near death experience, which we'll get into at the age of three years old. Uh, but the title was very much inspired to speak to the times in a sense that I'm we're noticing what's going on, you know, is, is affecting the upper respiratory yeah. and people are feeling as if the rug of life has been pulled underneath them or they're feeling very breathless and grasping for straws. And so my goal is, you know, when, when we're feeling absolutely nothing, we have everything to hold on to. And that's a sacred, that's a sacred temple that's never left us. And, yes. and so what I had 27 years ago, it's my hope and prayer could speak to uh, the condition now, because I think, you know, that, that playbook is, is seamless and eternal. It, it doesn't go and it could be implemented and integrated in any particular situation throughout humanity, you know, Definitely. connecting to the temple within, in the face of intense adversity. That's got the same themes run through, regardless of what we go through in life. Yeah. yeah, different eras, different yeah. time frames, you know, but a, you know, but a positionality of stimuli response living from the inside, the outside. And there's a lot of blessings behind adversity in a sense that it causes a little bit of turbulence and discomfort. And that expedites people to reevaluate and to integrate something different than they were doing before. And, you know, long term, that does lead to growth. It's hard to find a correlation with growth without, you know, adversity or hardships or difficulty associated with it. Otherwise, we get complacent and chill by the pool side and nothing really evolves and changes without that shakeup period. So I think that's but, what's happening for a lot of us. Yeah. So true. I, I totally agree. Well, what was the um, shift that happened within you both prior to your near-death experience and, and, and the process and then the shift that happened after after because I noticed that there's a real consciousness shift there is a shift in um, our way of interacting with the world after we go through an experience like that so can you speak to that Jake about the uh, I mean I know you're only three so it's a little bit harder to you know right. Right. Put, into, <laughs> put into you know a, a rationale but you know, there, I notice with near-death experiences, people often go through this and then they feel really compelled to fulfil their greatest potential and to just make everything they can of their life, which sure. wasn't potentially there before. So tell me about that. You know, what, what I would say is there is an uh, immense amount of stigmatization against infants in the sense that there's an associative um, value placed on the body and the direct correlation with body and, and development. And you look at, you know, my perspective and a different psychodynamic and psychoanalytic in terms of stage theories and how we look at the body as a plain vessel of emptiness. And so, you know, my experience was, well, what happens if you have something that is totally outside the realm of the body and the body is no longer there? How does that influence stage development. And if you ever watched, you know, the, I think there was a movie with Brad Pitt. I do, I'm kind of forgetting about it, but it's in a sense that he had a reversive developmental age, you know, develop, you know, I, I'm forgetting the movie, Benjamin Buttons, I'm sorry. That's it, and yeah. so kind of, that's the way I see not just myself, but people, you know, infants just born into this world where we were full of wisdom. And sometimes we lose the soul and the human experience. Mm -hmm. So and true. So, so true. And so for, and so for me, I was put in this classroom and all this kind of things to learn the analytical side of integration, the human experience, while at the same time, you know, all that was a deprivation and, um, you know, in, in, in a way that was eroding, you know, that, that pure connection to the soul and higher awareness. And so my experience, I look at it um, as a double-edged sword, in a sense, for those listening, I didn't have my experience as three-year-old body, Jake, in a sense. I had my experience as an eternal soul. Yeah. And what the way I see it is developmentally, there's an externalized 
uh, perception that we have in a processing of life that we have, which takes time, but the internal processing of life is eternal. Mm. And so for myself to be able to develop an emotional lexicon of vocabulary to really put in the you know indescribable elements of my near-death experience took time. And actually near-death experience researchers, you know, most notably a woman by the name of PMH Atwater, who specializes in infant and childhood near-death experience discussed that it takes around 20 to 30 years to process a near-death experience as an infant. Yeah. Uh, I was quite fortunate to have uh, people around me who gave a terminology of what it was. And one of those men is Raymond Moody. He wrote the book Life After Life and diagnosed the near-death experience. I thought I was the only one. So to read other books yeah. gave me universality of the overall terminology and diagnosis of what I had because I didn't know. And so to answer your question, there was trauma that was very real uh, because I suffocated due mm -hmm. to a, an upper respiratory infection called pertussis or generically known as whooping cough, which is a highly contagious fatal, you know, infection, you know, for, for young infants. And so I caught the virus and that led to uh, suffocation at the time. You know, no one really around me knew about it, but it was an intense trauma. I remember very little from my childhood, but when you have such an intensified trauma, you know, there tends to be a memory of the surrounding events around that time before and after. And after that, there's a bit of a memory block that we have. And so it was the way I see it from a psychotherapist is it was very, it was an, an immense trauma that I had. On the other side of it was an, was an incredible euphoric polarizing experience and so there, after suffocating, there was absolutely no life where, you know, if you listen to those words, it kind of rolls off the mind one ear out the other. But imagine, you know, pure nothingness and pure suffocation and out of your control, everything's shutting down at the age of three, bodily age of three, when just getting adjusted to the body, that was the most traumatic experience that I could have. You know, and once I lost all my breath, I was able to gain the breath of eternity. It really made me more appreciative of the body of the breath and also to recognize the breath is not just a physiological experience. You know, when we're breathing, we're really opening up to that eternal sacred breath uh, from inhale, in spirit, exhale experience, you know, in spirit. So. I hope that I hope that makes sense to 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 you about what what transpired during those sequences. So t tell us about the what you actually went to on an emotional feeling level after you um, transitioned into into that other dimensional realm. What what, what sure. was the feeling? What was the experience in depth? Because that people are so interested by what happens mm -hmm. when we transition. You know, it's not like you totally change. Mm -hmm. You carry not the outer part, not the body, not the developmental age, but a sacred soul that has lived many lifetimes in that inner processing of life. That's you. That's very real. Mm. How we portray that to the world is not, you know, necessarily you. That's the personality development, you know, within this lifetime on this page. But you connect to the entire book, you know, on the inside, and that's eternal. And so I look at it as a soul, as a sacred eternal observer of life, an inner processor of life that is well beyond the body and time. And so you take that collective energy with you, that doesn't change. Now it does change as what you're aware of and what you're around. And so at least my experience, it was, it was very overwhelming what I'll say, it was familiar, but almost kind of like you take a fish and just put it into water. It was just such a, you know, shell shock to my system. It did, it did take some time to acclimate to the higher realm. I use the term other side, but what I'll say is the other side from what I experienced is not just limited to one particular dimension. It's, there's many rays and levels of it. Yes. Um, I like to look at what I experience as mostly the light and the angelic realm of it, but there's 
other realms that I talk about in my book and other realms that I even have privately that I can't even find the right verbiage to really portray. But the biggest word was being very overwhelmed, having an adjustment to it. A part of me too was very doubting and skeptical in a sense that yes, it was familiar, but I just thought I was, you know, making this up in my own head or hallucinating. It was just so overwhelming that it didn't seem real. Now, when you do pass on, you do cross over to either side, you do take on a form. And so when I felt myself, there was, you want to call it an auric field or electromagnetic field, or whatever you want to, or just the, the body of the soul, I was able to feel a field that I carry. And so I wasn't able to see it the way that other people see it, but I felt, you know, a shape and a form, you know, on the other realm. But on the positive end, um, it's the most euphoric, unconditional love, transparency, protection, and understanding that you could possibly imagine. And that to me was the biggest adjustment uh, because even at age three, you're used to, you know, no matter what, you're used to having a limitation for love. Mm -hmm. There's sometimes a, a checklist of it. Yes. And so on the other side, you're not loved by what you did, but you're loved by who you are and what's always there. That's true. I guess the adjustment with that, Jacob, is too that when you felt that overwhelming, um, unconditional love. It was overwhelming in a good way. Yeah, yeah it, it would be therefore hard to, in a sense, to, to continue in the earthly realm without the fullest expression of that while you're here because it's like you get a taste of it and then it's taken away and then you still have to continue on in the, in the earthly realm without that fullest expression of that. And I guess you're always striving to bring that back in all the time um, sure. by opening your heart and, you know, connecting to the source and things. But it, it may be hard, I, I imagine, to replicate that again in the way that you experienced it through that near death experience. You know for readers interested, I'll give a little bit of a, one part of my book. I don't, I don't wish to get into the full experience in a sense that I would like viewers to take what I have and, and to open up the book and to learn more. If I were to say everything, you know, it would be giving the full book away and it would be quite boring. <laughs> I want people to really look at the book and learn, you know, something, something else and continue their education and what happened. Um, because the book has a life of its own. Yeah. But my experience happened in a playground, ironically. Mm -hmm. um, and I was going up on a ladder on a slide. And my name is Jacob. And those are familiar with Jacob from Genesis, how he had a dream of the angels going up and down a ladder. Um, that similarly happened to myself. Now, why I say that is, you know, to bring up your point, there was one point in my life, and I talked about this book, was a very low point. I mean, part of my drive, I talk a little bit about this in my book, to stay was, was for, you know, my parents, you know, and, and wanting to stay for them and for this big, you know, mission that I saw and that, that transcended time. But there was a moment when I got into an altercation and teenagers are teenagers and I was, a, you know, late teen and got thrown out of the house for acting like a jerk. I probably deserved it, you know, but at that moment, I walked unknowingly around the corner to a school and I sat in a park and to myself, I just sank low into apathy and the lowest possible feeling. And I just felt, what kind of monster have I become? You know, how could I do this? I, I'm no good, all these things. And then right in front of me, there was a playground, there was a slide, there was all these things. And in that moment, either though I didn't technically have a home in the moment at, at my parents, which all worked out, we all worked things out, I saw that I was an eternal child in God's playground. And I could never leave that no matter what the outside world told me. And I could always go back to that sacred place, no matter what rug was pulled. And I think that's a similar test that we all have. Mm. We all feel tested that life is against us or that we have no home. The world is against us. The rug is pulled. 
I think that's what's happening today. And so that's really what about faith is. Um, you know, it would be so easy if everything was right in front of us, we wouldn't need to have it. And so mm. we're back against the wall. That's when we really need to tap into, you know, that that palace within, that, that dwelling place within, that part of us that can never be taken despite the outside winds. Or as Christ would say, when the strongest winds or strongest opposition comes against us, we need to have a strongest foundation. And that's my goal of my book is to give people back a foundation when they feel foundationless. So how do you encourage people to take that journey inward? You know, there might be some people out there that are used to externalizing everything and living their life based on all the external things happening around them. How do you encourage people to, to go inside and find that foundation from within, which truly is the only solid thing that we can hold on to at the moment? I would say everyone is at a different play, playbook of their own life. Everyone's at a different stage. Mm -hmm. I think eventually within life, um, I look at it come almost like a beach ball. There's so much time and effort they could put to bogging down the real you until it creates some type of, um, you know, you know, some, some type of epiphany or awakening or, or some type, some type of soul agitation that you need to listen to, or this whisper of the soul. And the more you ignore it, the more you run away from it, the louder it gets. And a lot of people um, right now, they're saying, what's my soul's purpose? What's my life's purpose? And a lot of people are running, they self-medicate, they try all these things to run from that which never left us. And so what I would say is develop on your own, embrace what you're going through. And when you're feeling really isolated and alone, knowing that it's okay to not only ask for help or ask for guidance, but to ask for guidance within yourself and within your surrounding force field. Because um, let's speak about this in my, in my next book. There's no greater illusion um, than being totally alone. Now you could feel totally alone, have, you could have, you got everything around you and feel isolated and nothing around you and feel connected. And so it's a state of mind Yes. Um, but, I, but I think really it's, it's that acknowledgement, that awareness and, and, and the importance of um, not trying to be Mr. Atlas and muscle everything on your own, that it's okay to surrender. Because I think when, once we surrender, that's when we could be an open channel um, for higher awareness, higher consciousness and change. Can, can I tell you the most amazing syn synchronicity happened because this morning I was actually talking to someone that illustrates exactly what you're saying because right, right, they, right. that their younger brother was um, in the ocean and they went down to this ocean to have a you know paddle but they missed there was a sign saying that there was a really dangerous undertone that they shouldn't swim with so they missed that and they went down and and the 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 boy was in the water and. Um, this undertow came and started to drag him out and he literally felt this hand come up from underneath and hold his hand and pull him back towards the shore. So that is the illustration of that this um, being that was not in the physical dimension, not in the physical reality, literally came and pulled him by the hand to save his life and bring him back to shore. And that, and that is such a representation of the fact that we are never alone. Absolutely. And, and miracles I just see is, is a change of perception. You know, it's the awareness of the sacredness that we're all connected to. It is happening and unfolding at every moment. A lot of people expect, you know, just Jesus to come in front of them like poof. But I think really if we integrate mindfulness and we integrate awareness there are signs, symbols, and awakenings around us all the time. We just have to become aware of that. And whatever we're looking for, we will find. If that's pain, we'll attract more pain. We're, we're the great attractor. Yeah. But I think really we're the great observer. And so if there's one word to describe the soul, I would say it's the observer of life, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and the one who is, is aware, awakened. And I know you mentioned that is a big um, you know, impetus and driving point of near-death experiences is, is, is a passion. But I view that as the soul's DNA, is passion. Once you're connected to the soul, the soul carnates out of passion, out of desire. 
uh, out of a wanting to really take itself into this earth plane, evolve itself, learn further of what it is and, and, and this ever ending intelligence and to be able to tap in a greater frequency in the collective tapestry of humanity. You know, I think we all have our notes, um, but I think within each and every lifetime, those notes operate at higher octaves and collect a greater frequency to each other. And I think really we're all just musicians and, and playing our sound and pitch within every lifetime. And, and, and very appropriate because I, I'm a um, singer, songwriter, musician myself, so I can yeah. totally relate to that. You, yes. you, you walk the talk, sister. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so t tell me, Jacob, what what are the notes for you that that bring you the greatest passion at this moment, going through this uh, year where we're all being tested to dig deep. And, and to rise above because once you submit to, to the lower frequency energies, to the lower vibrations, you can just very quickly and easily fall into a hole. So yeah. what, what are some examples that you can give us of how you connect to your passion this year, how you connect to those special notes right. that really bring you that, that raising in um, consciousness, raising in frequency? Well, the finest note I've ever heard came out of the mouth of James Taylor. Um, I would say that gives me peace and solace and joy. Uh, That's a great octave. But yeah. to get practical, um, I, I looked at the book as something, you know, as a model, you know, that I think we could all do in a sense that it's quite easy to give in, to give up, and to let life dictate you and not dictate life. Life, let life play you and not play life. Mm. And I think the biggest thing is, is recognizing that the outside, what's happening is real. But we also have to have our own momentum to counter the winds at hand. We have to have our own force. And so I would say right now is, is a great time to really dig deep on what's really in there. And if yes. we're able to do that, you know, I think a lot of people are awakening. And I talk about this in my introduction that, you know, we're here just to more than just to support and pay the bills. Mm. You know, this is not, and this is what I learned in my near-death experience. This is not just a human thing. This is a spiritual thing that we're in. And spiritual is not just um, monopolized by Ram Dass or any of these gurus. Uh, it's something that we're all eternally connected to. And I think the people who are quote unquote spiritual are just simply the people who acknowledge, recognize it and integrate it. Yes. And I think more and more people are opening up because they're feeling deprived in their lives and they're not feeding, they're feeding their bodies, but not their soul. So what I would say, the biggest note that we could have is to allow your pain to define your purpose and to not be by passive of what you're going through to go through that is very real you know but to allow that to really sharpen that masterpiece that's already there you know hunker deep in and you'll be surprised by how much is really inside of you how much you're capable of they say we only use a small percentage of our brains and certainly when my brain literally cracked because of suffocation and god came in as a statement would go i recognized how little of the filter of our brains that we use, but also how little of the soul we use and in, in our true spirit. And yes. there's just so much in there and so much that we're connected to that I can't find words or, 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 or vocabulary to, to describe. Yes, the English language is limited when it comes to these <laughs> things, isn't it? It, 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 it is, but it, it's, it's a greatest superpower and tool for other people. And the more interviews, the more reps, the more writing that you can do, mm. the better you're able to own it in this body, in this lifetime, and the better you're able to portray it. I always see us as artists, and we have a canvas in front of us, and yes. this near-death experience happened, but my job is to be an artist and to draw. See, I'm the least musically inclined, talented-wise, and artistic point of view, but I think in a way we're 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 all artists we're all musicians yeah you know we're all creative yes. forces because at the end of the day the soul's dna is creative life force energy it's true we are creators of our own 
reality in many ways, not the world that necessarily we into, although there's a magnetic force field and attractive, you know, component to it, but soul is creative force. Um, that's, that's what I will say. And your book is your creation, you know, your, your book that, that's yeah. really creative. Um, the, another way that I would uh, word what you were just paraphrasing is um, we're going from like a slave consciousness or mentality where we are controlled or we're manipulated to one where we are sovereign beings, where we embrace sure. our own um, sovereignty, that nobody can control us. We have free will and that we um, very strongly are now standing up and saying, no, we will not be controlled. We are standing in our own empowerment. And, mm -hmm. and that's another way that I would paraphrase it at the moment for what's happening that, that was sort of what you were saying, but in different wording. If, if Absolutely. You know, and I think if anyone's interested, we could learn an immense amount from Greek philosophers, mm -hmm. uh, from Pythagoras to Plato to Aristotle. But Plato, and I, th and I believe the Republic wrote about the allegory of the cave, where I know in English literature throughout high school and college, I would I was so enamored by that. I didn't know why back in high school. But you know, that's been something that humanity has faced for hundreds of years, where we could be prisoners of the shadows, as Plato discusses, or we could break out of the shackles and have a new awakening and to get out of the programming. And the any spiritually transformative experience, whether that is what I had, near-death experience, or a spiritual transformative experience, out-of-body experience, shared death experience, it's all many paths up the mountain, but a similar light. And Plato's allegory, the cave, is a great illustration of what we're going through and as well as um, a better understanding of transformation that could happen. Can, can so. I tell you that one of my role models and actually is a um, ascended master being that, that is with me in my energy field is Socrates. I love Socrates. Oh, yeah, and, well, well, um, yeah. the, the, the incredible philosopher that he was, uh, he, he would draw in crowds of the youth, you know, in, in his time and speak to them, you know, his knowledge and wisdom, and they would all listen. Um, and, and interestingly, he, in, within his family, his own three children, because he separated from his wife and, and his own three children rejected him in a sense, but he would go out and speak to all the, um, the youth and, and they would learn from him and, you know. Uh, Absolutely. The, the Socratic... The Socratic method, question and answer, all that stuff. Mm. Yeah, and that, that's that's wonderful. And for viewers who are interested in learning a little bit more about philosophy and its associative component and parallels with near death experience, and, and, you know, and all these things, I recommend checking out. He's on my cover, Dr. Raymond Moody. He's got a PhD in philosophy. I know just the bare basics, but he listened to any interview that Raymond does. He talks about logic and philosophers mm. and, uh, you know, predated philosophers and their viewpoints on near-death experiences and and past lives and all these things that I look at Dr. Raymond Moody as a modern-day Socrates or Plato. He's a humble guy. He would admit that. But please well, check him out. He is brilliant. Uh, I agree. You know, when I was on my metaphysical path, um, when I first began on it, they were some of the very first books that I read were the Raymond Moody books, Life After Life. Yeah. And yes, and, and it's a great entree into the metaphysical world in understanding yeah. uh, our eternal being and our divine mm -hmm. connection and, and all those things. So uh, that, that was something that was formative for me too when I, when I first began on this journey of seeing everything from a much grander perspective. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I, I I would love you to um, share share with me, Jacob, something that you think is really important about this time. You know, um, perhaps a a learning or um, an observation of what what we can do at this moment in time, which is a transition really from a lower consciousness to a higher consciousness. I feel. Um, what what what's a gift that you can give to the to the listeners in terms of your own inner uh, standing um, and knowing about 
what we're going through at the moment collectively and individually? Yes, you know, that's that's a long-winded answer <laughs> and a wonderful question. <laughs> to sum it up, I would say for people to find ways to develop your purpose behind pain. Mm. I think in a way, you know, pain, I look at it as AOF or behind on floor. You know, it's a great motivator, you know, for ourselves. And, and you know, pain could truly lead to gain. And it's very hard to find people who are teaching, whether that's, you know, let's say, look at Neil Donald Walsh, Eckhart Tolle. Both those men were, you know, either homeless or living in trailers and having nothing. And, mm. you know, I look at them as my role models in life where they were at ground zero from the human standpoint, right? In terms of- Can I say, Eckhart Tolle says we're, we're all living in a bit of an insane asylum, I think. I I'm sorry? Saying that, I remember Eckhart Tolle yeah. saying we're all. Yeah, we, we actually share the same. Uh, we share the same <laughs> literary agent, um, but 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 both those guys, I, I look at a prime example, where they had no, absolutely nothing and they were able to really access a downloaded awakening and a transformation. You know, I think the biggest thing is just letting go of 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 so many things and allowing ourselves to really kind of be like a solar being, you know, instead of really going with where life takes us, you know, on the, on the, on the tides to have an eternal connection that really allows us to recharge, reconnect and to find guidance within our everyday lives. I think a lot of people try to find all the answers to what right is happening right now, you know, from their own left brain or whatever is being put in front of them, but the answers with you has never left you. And the answer is really, could be learned throughout time. If you look at, you know, I'm Jewish, so I will speak about this regularly. I mean, you look at the Holocaust and whatever we're going through, it's it, it's it's a similar storm, but everyone's in a different boat, obviously. And, you know, there's people who don't have family members right now at their dinner table, you know, and are struggling financially. It's the pain is, is very much unbearable. But you know, look at the Holocaust. There was a there was a man by the name of Victor E. Frankel who wrote the book Man's yes. Search for Meaning. One of the best books ever written. One of the best books of all time. And he had absolutely nothing, but he found a gateway and key to freedom. Yes. You know, from living from the inside out and you know taking away, you know, the captivity from the outside world and really honing in on that you know masterpiece within that never left him. No matter what was in front of him, he had freedom. This is so true. This is so true. Um, he was in the ultimate jail and yet he had freedom. Yep. And I think, you know what, the, the essence of that spiritually in, in the learning in that is that as we surrender our attachment and we let go, we let God come in, we let that divine connection come in. So the attachment to having a certain type of life or quality of life, he had to let all that go and just be and just exist. Mm -hmm and just appreciate that presence and that moment as opposed to thinking, um, you know, freedom is the only way that I can be happy or something like that. So it's, it's in that process of letting go and surrendering that we can often have the greatest epiphanies mm -hmm. and the greatest um, yeah. learnings, I think. Yeah. Does that, yeah. Does that I, really I Absolutely. You know, I'd say living from the inside out versus the outside in mm. and having, you know, the dependence of that light to lead to the independence of the outside forces of life that we walk into. Mm. I think when we're dependent on life, you know, we lose freedom because mm. we're swayed, you know, much like a leaf in water. And, and, and I guess so, also, Jacob, dependent on belief systems, you know, all the old belief systems we had of, you know, the government is here to protect us and look after us. It's really unfolding now that the government has a very different agenda. <laughs> so it's releasing all those old ways of thinking, all those belief systems that we thought were, um, you know, our structure, our foundation that totally don't exist. And, and starting really from scratch with a whole new way of seeing the world, you know, there, 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 there's the deepest levels when you go down the rabbit hole of, of nefarious mm. activity, darkness, you know, the pedophilia, the child trafficking, all that sort of stuff. And yet when, you, um, when you're able to release 
um, see that, but release attachment to how you think the world should be. I mean, it, it has been that way, but um, it's releasing that and then being able to draw in the new, you know, being able to draw in um, a new way of being in the world, a new uh, existence for the collective that is based on much higher uh, morals, much higher standards, much higher principles. Absolutely. And the notion that someone else's pain is not yours um, or doesn't matter just mm -hmm. because you're not feeling it, you know, I think right now is decreased, you know, because we look at it, this is something that has unifiably attacked the human body. There are people with cumulative advantage or disadvantages, you know, against this and comorbidities, obviously, that are in different situations. But this has been something, you know, that has attacked uniformly the human body. And so the way I see it is, you know, we look at, look at someone else who's ill and just say, oh, you know, that's their stuff. I don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about it. But I think really what you do is you find a way to find purpose behind it and meaning behind it. Do all that you can mm -hmm. to help out on a micro, meso, and macro basis to assist. Much like you would if you had a part of your body that was ill. You would do everything you could to assist this. I think with the global body, I think right now that should lead to purpose, you know, and I think the more connected we are to yes. the self and the eternal soul, the more that we're connected to this global body and the more that we recognize the ultimate collateral of our, our existence is the wave that we have around the world, not the wave that we take in in our bank account and the life that we live That's right. and the waves that we just notice on the beach in front of us. It's the yes. wave that we put out. So this, this in its essence is the great activator. It's activating us to stand up not only for ourselves but for humanity, for, for, for everyone else. Um, Absolutely. Not to speak the words but to actually take action in, in profound ways. That, and, and I think yeah. the great takeaway from this interview is to be able to uh, do that in your own way. Yeah. yeah. When you look at wartime, there's many different parts of the army. There's the Air Force, there's the Navy, there's the, you know, and so I think right now everyone's got different gifts and, you know, different passions and, and different, you know, organizations and, and, and parts of their community that they're part of, but in their own way, you know, making that difference, making that impact, whatever that is. Um, a lot of people associate making a difference, like being Eckhart Tolle, Neil Donna Walsh, and they're great by having a big venue and speaking in front of thousands of people. And that, that's one way of making a difference. But, um, you know, another way could just be you're in a supermarket, socially distanced with a mask and you, you know, give someone a good look or you, you send out good energy to someone or you wave hello to someone. You just don't know what that might do uh, to someone struggling. And, you know, so there's, there's small little acts that we can do to, to make a difference. I think to connect from human to human now is so important to, to I mean, I have a different, a bit of a different philosophy on the social distancing and the masking, but we won't, we won't go there. But I, but I totally agree with that thing about, you know, connecting the really importance of connecting um, human to human now, because we're, we're feeling the energy of, of disconnections, uh, with everything happening, and and so we have to go again, do the opposite, which is 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 connect even more, you know. And um, I think that that's really profound as well. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. that's that's a very important component. Um, I would say, why would why were we born here with millions and billions of people on the planet? Why weren't we born in a stranded island? You know, there's a reason behind, you know, the Earth's inhabitants. Um, yes. Yes. There. We're connected so many ways, and science has proven that through the mirror neurons of the brain, you know, that's able to deal with empathy and you know, all that stuff. So, you know, Harvard science proves that there's a connection, there's an undeniable neurological connection that we have to, to one another. Well, there you so are in New York. Here I am in um, outside Melbourne, and we're yeah. energetically we're, we're aligned on the same page, and it's like opposite. It's like, you know, it's like I could. <laughs> grab my computer and say hello and be right there and you're a 26 27 hour plane ride away from me it's 
yeah. on the other side of the earth. It's it's, yeah. it's just crazy. But <laughs> all that goes out the window within that's today. True. And that's, that's the beauty of today is is this connected this interconnectedness that we have you know, through technology. And it's just it's amazing. Yeah. It's it's a bug out in a way. You know, <laughs> how far, how many miles, how many oceans, you know, how many so cities and <laughs> right there in front of me. That's right. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you, Jack. It's been so wonderful to chat with you. I really encourage everyone to purchase your book, Life After Breath, and yes. to um, go to your Facebook page, your your um, we'll website. All the details, website. All the details will be below and um, where you can connect with Jacob. And um, if anyone wants to connect with me, I also have a website below where I do uh, work as well with people. So um, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. We really appreciate you taking your special time in your day to uh, be part of this and to join us. And, Jacob, I uh, look forward to connecting again soon with you. Thank you so much. My greatest honour. Keep up the great work, and thank you, viewers, for listening and tuning in. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank <laughs> you.